to the clip. And then we're gonna start to see participants flood in and then I will also be sure to share the photo at the end. All right, we're just gonna give everyone a few more minutes to uh, trickle on in, but it's great to see so many people logging in. Thanks for being here. And we'll get started in just a moment. All right, so let's get started. Um, good afternoon, maybe good morning to some and even good evening to others. Uh, thank you so much for joining the Samira Foundations from the Experts monthly webinar series. My name is Samira. I am the founder and executive director of the organization. We are dedicated to raising awareness of neuromyelitis optica and MOG. Um, we also fundraise to support breakthroughs in research and are very passionate about building communities of support for patients, caregivers, and clinicians around the globe. And we are so pleased to bring um, this webinar to you today about vaccine efficacy among the immune suppressed community. Um, First and foremost, I would like to thank Horizon Therapeutics for um, their patient education grant to facilitate this program. Um, and Horizon Therapeutics is the manufacturers of Uplisna, which is now one of the three FDA approved therapies for NMOSD. Without further ado, I would like to introduce you all to neurologist and NMO specialist, Dr. Elena Grabenciakova. She is based in Chicago and practices at Northwestern Medicine. And just before I turn um, the camera over to her, I would of course like to thank you all for being here and um, wanted to let you know that there is going to be an opportunity to ask Dr. Elena questions at the end. So don't be shy. Um, you know, uh, just populate your questions in the chat and as she will answer them in the order in which they are received. Um, and that's it. So thank you so much. I will turn it over to Dr. Elena. Hi, everyone. Good morning and good afternoon, wherever you are. So Myra, I thank you so much for inviting me. It's an honor to speak in front of the animal spectrum disorder community. Some of you may be my patients, some of them some of you I have never met, but uh, hello to everyone. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to acknowledge what a challenging time we all live in. Um, when the virus came, everybody 
was so scared about what does it mean in terms of immunosuppressive medications? What does it mean in terms of the risks of mortality and severe illness? Luckily, over time, as we learned how to manage COVID a little bit better, as we learned about it, as we have uh, made the vaccines available, things are looking a little better, but we are certainly not in the clear. And so today, I want to talk a little bit about what does it mean to be immunosuppressed and to be vaccinated? Um, many of the questions that often come up uh, from patients with animal spectrum disorder and people with any um, autoimmune diseases is one, are these vaccines safe for me? Um, are they effective? After all, we are hearing about the Delta virus, the breakthrough infections. Um, three, could a vaccine trigger me to have an attack, a relapse? And four is, you know, what do I do? When do I get it? Uh, I am on this medication or that medication. But of course, the most common question that we hear is, is it safe for me to take the vaccine? So today I'm going to try and tackle some of these answers based on the data that we have available so far, based on my experience in patient care, based on the experiences of my patients, not only with neuromyelitis optica, but also with many other autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis, autoimmune encephalitis, et cetera. Um, so as you may know, um, since COVID came, over 600,000 people in the United States have died. With the invention of the vaccines, we have been given a wonderful opportunity to reduce the risk of dying uh, from COVID and to prevent so many deaths. And so currently in the United States, over 165 million people have been fully vaccinated against COVID. And this is a formidable data because it allows us to know how safe are these vaccines in reality. And when I talk about the vaccines and I talk about their safety, I come at this con you know, topic, I approach this topic from a very personal place. And I'm going to take literally less than one minute and share uh, my story. So when I was a child, I was diagnosed with a rare um, tumor um, that involved lymph nodes in my immune system. And after surgery, the doctors and my parents were uncertain whether I could get vaccinated. Some said, yes, you should. Some said, no, you shouldn't. But my parents were so scared. They never vaccinated me. As a result, I had every single infection, respiratory infection, a child, a teenager could get. And I spent a formidable amount of my childhood in hospitals. Many of these infections were preventable infections if I had been vaccinated. And one infection, it was whooping cough, um, pertussis, that is a preventable illness, ended up um, making me very sick for more than several months. And as you can imagine, that has a tremendous impact on a child and a teenager when they're continuously sick and hospitalized. And I have been a patient and I have been sick quite often and in some instances severely ill. And so I know what it's like to be afraid, what it's like not to be able to breathe. And I know what it's like not to be vaccinated when a vaccine is available and it could have prevented that. Um, and so today, this topic is very dear to my heart um, because I want to make sure that people know um, that the vaccines are available and they are preventing the risk of death very effectively, um, preventing the risk of hospitalization very effectively. So today we'll try to look at some of that data and try to answer, um, kind of preemptively answer some of your questions. I was vaccinated with Pfizer um, on December the 21st and received my second shot, um, I believe three or four weeks later. I had minor side effects. All of my family members are vaccinated, minus my two-year-old child. Um, 
And most of my patients in my practice are currently vaccinated. And uh, we have not, I'm very proud to say that we have not had any attacks or relapses uh, following uh, COVID vaccination. Our patients have done exceedingly well, uh, wonderfully well. And so I'm very happy to you know, share that news as just somebody who you know, is seeing a lot of people with autoimmune diseases that include MS and animal spectrum disorders. Um, and so to start this conversation a little bit, I um, would like to sort of ask a general question, you know, are vaccines safe for patients with neuromyelitis optica? The common fear that many patients share is that a vaccine could trigger a relapse. So is it true? So current data and experience suggest that the vaccines actually are safe for people with animal spectrum disorders who are on immunomodulatory immunosuppressive drugs, medications, and who are stable. And in these patients who are on a treatment, effective immunosuppressive immunomodulatory treatment, vaccines are not likely to cause neuromyelitis optica relapse. Um, what I am saying is based on a study by um, Dr. Michael Levy and his colleagues, including Maureen uh, Milley. And uh, this study actually preceded the COVID time and it was published in 2018. But what Dr. Levy, um, previously at Johns Hopkins and now at Harvard at MGH, uh, what they did is they followed 90 people with animal spectrum disorder for about six and a half years. And during that time, um, these 90 patients went through 211 vaccinations. And so what they looked at is to see whether within three months post-vaccination, patients with an animal spectrum disorder, whether they had an increased risk of relapse or an actual attack. And so what they found um, is that the vaccines were associated with relapses only in patients who were not on preventive immunotherapy. So in people who were treated for animal spectrum disorder with immunosuppressive medications, that risk was exceedingly low. I believe they isolated only 16 patients who had attacks post vaccines and the vast majority of those, nearly 14 of them were not being treated with immunosuppressive medications. So the increased likelihood of vaccine-associated relapses was not present among patients in, in this cohort that was using preventive immunotherapy, immunosuppression. So as a result, the recommendation based on that data was that NMO patients after initiation of preventive immunotherapy um, uh, should be able to get vaccinated effectively against COVID. Um, and so these data are reassuring and the data really makes sense. That's sort of what we see in patients with other autoimmune diseases, including multiple sclerosis. In multiple sclerosis, um, just like in animal spectrum disorder, um, we do vaccinate patients against COVID, um, and, but making sure that they are on a good immunosuppressive immunomodulating therapy. But those people who are not being treated or who are not stable in their disease, um, who may have just recently had an attack, that's where um, you really need to discuss with your physician um, because the safety is really more so for people who are on an immunosuppressive medication. Um, so if you still have doubts about whether you should get vaccinated and you are on a good neuromyelitis optical spectrum disorder treatment, you are on an immunosuppressive medication, immunomodulatory medication, um, the way to think about it is this. Well, if a vaccine is going to stimulate my immune system and theoretically it could you know, trigger it, right? What about the actual infection? What would stimulate my immune system more, an infection or um, the vaccine? The answer is undoubtedly the actual infection. 
And the infections are going to be unavoidable. There is no way to truly escape them. Um, the only way to, I mean, of course, we have to wear masks and wash our hands, but infections are likely here to stay, meaning that it's going to be very challenging to ensure that we avoid it no matter how much we try, uh, even with appropriate mask use and washing our hands and doing everything right, right? And we are seeing um, so many people infected, um, you know, this summer, and the cases are probably going to go up in the winter. Um, so it's very important to do everything we can to prevent the infection. And if we cannot prevent it, to reduce the severity of the infection, which is what these vaccines are really good at. The current vaccines, even though they are not necessarily available to fully prevent the Delta variant infection, as we have seen um, in the outbreak in the small town in Massachusetts. Um, these vaccines reduce the mortality and reduce um, the risk of hospitalization by more than 90%, and that's formidable. Um, so um, you do need to get vaccinated, um, but after discussing with your physician um, your specifics, the specifics of your disease control, um, the specifics of your immunosuppressive medication, and jointly with your physician make that decision. It is always very important to discuss with your physician the timing of the vaccination um, and, um, you know, go over the safety in your specific case. Um, and so, you know, back to what I mentioned about the infection stimulating your immune system more formidably than the vaccine, right? So if you are choosing between even the slightest risks, um, the general um, kind of logical step would be to choose the vaccine because vaccine is exceedingly less immunostimulatory than the infection itself. Moreover, the infection of COVID beyond the obvious lung issues that has led to many deaths. And we even had a patient with neuromyelitis optica um, that was on the news who um, had such a severe COVID um, that ended up with a double lung transplant. So this is very serious. This was before the vaccines. Um, and, you know, the infection itself can result not only in pneumonia and the risk of dying and being hospitalized, but obviously in so many other neurological side effects, things like, um, uh, you know, Guillain-Barre syndrome, things like ADEM, uh, acute demyelinating encephalomyelopathy, um, things like uh, cognitive issues, headaches, uh, brain fog that we are seeing post-COVID infection, and other rare neurological uh, conditions, including the risk of strokes, which we have seen uh, medium and large vessel strokes in some young people who had COVID, and they didn't even have severe COVID. So there are very serious things that can happen, needless to say, right, if you get the COVID infection. So the goal is to prevent that, if at all possible. And even if you still can catch Delta, these vaccines will decrease the risk of severe hospitalization. They will, uh, severe illness hospitalization, they will decrease the risk of dying. And so what we learned uh, from Provincetown outbreak um, in Massachusetts is that, remember, when when they reported about 900 cases of breakthrough um, with, with, with Delta variant, um, three fourths of those people were vaccinated. And you'll say, well, then what's the point of getting vaccinated? Aren't people you know, still getting the Delta variant? Yes, but what we learned is that out of those 900 cases, only seven people were hospitalized. No one died. If you know, in a pre-vaccination world, we would have expected that 90, at least about 90 to 100 or more people would have been hospitalized. And we would have expected that nine of them would have died. That's pre-vaccination. So the vaccines are working tremendously to reduce the risk of hospitalization, to reduce the risk of mortality. And this is the same trend that we are seeing across the world, including Israel, uh, reports of reduced risk of hospitalization and reduced risk of mortality. Uh, even in breakthrough Delta virus uh, variant infections uh, post-vaccination. Um, and so, um, you know, trying to move on a little bit uh, with questions, uh, I think some of the other things that patients often ask me is, I'm an immunosuppressive medication, how protected will I be? Well, we know that some of the immunosuppressive medications definitely 
and decrease the efficacy of the vaccines. And here uh, we have to make a caveat, right? So each immunosuppressive medication has a different mechanism of action. So for example, medications like rituximab, rituxan, or enabilizumab, they deplete B cells. And B cells are the ones that make antibodies. But these medications do not deplete T cells. And T cells are actually very important in fighting the virus. So T cells are the ones that kill the virus. Um, so when you get a vaccine, um, you, there are two things that are happening. One is that your B cells uh, make antibodies, which can neutralize the virus and protect you. But you also familiarize your T cells, T cells that are not really uh, abolished or they are not depleted by rituximab or enabilism. So those T cells become specialized uh, virus killing cells. So they acquire an immunological memory. And so next time after the vaccine, if you encounter the virus, these T cells are now ready. They're familiar. Um, and, and so we think that even in those patients who do not make robust antibodies, um, to the vaccine in the setting of rituximab and in nebulizumab, most of these patients still have T cell mediated immunity benefit post vaccination, which is why it is so important because T cells are the actual killers of the virus. Um, so they will offer you some protection in reducing the risk of severe disease, the risk of hospitalization, and the risk of dying. People on rituximab and inabilizumab, generally, if they get vaccinated, they should get vaccinated towards the end of their infusion, the six-month infusion window, uh, where there is a chance that some of the B cells possibly started re-emerging a little bit. But you should always discuss the appropriate timing of the vaccination with your treating physician um, and see if there's any additional monitoring that needs to be done to ensure it's the right time for you. Now, um, people, we know that people in rituximab and in nebulizumab have reduced antibody responses. But we also know that the current tests um, that are available uh, to detect the antibody titers, these tests are actually validated only in the context of the actual infection. So if somebody had COVID, we can check the antibodies to see um, sort of if they had the actual infection, right, even before the vaccination. Many of these tests have not been validated in detecting the immune response in the setting of vaccination. So CDC actually issued a warning to the physicians to not heavily rely on these tests to detect post-vaccination immunity simply because they haven't been validated in that context. Um, so that's an additional reminder to say that, um, yes, it, these tests could be sent, but we cannot heavily rely on their validity because they have not been validated in that context. Um, T cell responses is not something that necessarily can be clinically monitored, um, but there are some tests um, that have an emergency authorization under the FDA that physicians can order. Um, so always talk to your physician um, to try and understand what is the best way to understand whether you got some immune response from the vaccine or not. Having said that, you should always assume that if you are in rituximab or in abilizumab that you likely have gotten some immune response is diminished, uh, but it still will offer you protection. It will reduce the risk of hospitalization and the risk of mortality, but you should continue exercising great caution because like all of us, you're not invulnerable to the disease, needless to say. Uh, people on medications like sartralizumab and tocilizumab, these medications are anti-interleukin-6, um, so that's your Actemra uh, and Spring. So these medications are not immunoablative. They do not deplete your immune system. They are directed against interleukin-6, which is sort of like a hormone of the immune system that both T cells and B cells use. 
in uh, these patient subsets, um, you know, at least when it comes to the data from the flu vaccines, um, patients typically are able to get a good immune response um, to the vaccine. And so that's what we anticipate in our patients with, um, you know, when they receive anti-COVID vaccines as well. Um, so these patients on sertralizumab and tocilizumab, yes, while their immune response is uh, modulated, it is not abrogated. In, it is not abrogated. So you should be able to get uh, a nice immune response um, to these vaccines. Uh, Eculizumab, um, Saliris, um, you should be okay getting uh, vaccinated while you're on Eculizumab, um, Saliris, and you should be able to get a very nice immune response if you're on that medication. Now, the question is about medications such as mycophenolate mofetil, which is Celsef, or azithioprine, which is Imuran, or methotrexate. Um, these medications affect both B cells and T cells. Um, they are anti-proliferative medications, and we know that they do decrease efficacy of the vaccines. Now, the patients on these medications still should get vaccinated because um, while these medications decrease efficacy, they do not fully abrogate it. So you still have B cells and you still have T cells. From the world of transplant uh, patients, we know that people who are on mycophenolate mofetil or azathioprine, for example, many of them do not make very robust amounts of antibody, but many of them do make at least a little bit of antibody. And the most importantly is that you still familiarize your immune system, your B cells and your T cells with what the virus looks like. And so when you encounter, if you encounter the virus in real life, um, then you, your immune system will be at least somewhat familiar with it, somewhat prepared, somewhat ready to fight it. And so the bottom line of um, this recommendation is that even though your immune response is reduced on medications such as rituximab, inabilizumab, uh, mycophenolate, mofetil, isothioprine, methotrexate, you should still get vaccinated. After discussing with your physician the timing, the risks versus benefits, which of course are unique to every patient, um, and designing the strategy in, uh, you know, um, Will you need to get revaccinated when the boosters become available and mandated by the CDC? What is the best timing? So I really encourage patients to always discuss these matters with your physicians. Uh, make sure that they approve of your plan, the timing of the vaccine, um, and sort of guide you along uh, the way, particularly with the rapidly changing climate. I think the data are evolving so rapidly that what we used to say five days ago may not necessarily always be correct a few days later. And so keeping up with that data is of course challenging for everyone, patients and physicians alike. And that's why it is so important while you're listening to me speaking about this, it is so important to continue these discussions with your respective physicians and always make sure that they are on board um, because they will be up to date uh, on the data on, uh, you know, as it evolves in the next months and years. Um, so use this conversation as a jumping up point uh, for questions and answers, but take the conversation to your respective physician for more updates as weeks pass by, months pass by, et cetera, because the data are evolving very, very, very rapidly. Um, so patients also ask me about rare side effects after some of these vaccines. So for example, early on, there were cases of Bell's palsy or facial paralysis in association with some of these vaccines. In my practice, we have been fortunate, we have not seen any of these side effects and these side effects appear to be extraordinarily rare. Um, less than 0.6% uh, of people have uh, have had something like this happen, which is a similar incidence that we see with other vaccines. I think that any vaccine in the world, um, because it stimulates the immune system, carries an exceedingly rare risk of different side effects. But luckily, these risks are so, so rare that vaccine, getting vaccinated is still the right thing to do. Um, 
So uh, in terms of the um, Guillain-Barre uh, syndrome um, associated, were, you know, most recently with Johnson & Johnson vaccine, the risk has been estimated to be very small at 0.0008%. Um, that's less than, you know, eight people per uh, 100,000. Um, so this is a very, very low risk. Um, and please remember that these cases have actually been reported with the actual uh, COVID infection. So a lot of these risks that people are worried about in the context of the vaccine are exceedingly rare in the context of the vaccine. They actually are not as rare in the context of COVID infection itself. And so we're definitely seeing cases of Guillain-Barre syndrome are like presentations after COVID infection itself. Um, we are seeing cases of myocarditis uh, after uh, COVID presentation itself um, as an infection, right? So recently there have been some news about um, some cases of myocarditis or heart inflammation in patients after messenger RNA vaccines. Um, and specifically, the rates were about 40 cases or so per millionth of second doses of messenger RNA vaccine. Um, you know, that's, that's an extraordinarily rare, rare incidence. Uh, while we know that COVID infection itself can cause myocarditis, can cause uh, heart inflammation, and the infection itself causes it so much more frequently. In fact, um, you know, they studied this in athletes. Um, they asked a question, what is the prevalence of myocarditis in competitive athletes after COVID-19 infection? And uh, what they found is that a screening with cardiovascular magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, uh, basically detected prevalence of clinical and subclinical myocarditis um, at 2.3% in those patients. So 2.3% patients who had COVID had some evidence of heart inflammation. That's really formidable. Uh, I think that that data goes back even to early in, in sort of March through May 2020, uh, coming from Italy. Uh, back then, they were looking at medical wards and looking at people who were admitted with COVID um, and uh, heart uh, issues. And uh, that study, for example, out of uh, uh, over a thousand patients with COVID who were admitted, they saw at least 1% of those patients had suspected acute myocarditis at the time of the admission. So please know that these exceedingly rare side effects that you read about uh, in association with the vaccine are exceedingly more rare uh, when it comes to the vaccine than what we are seeing in real world with the infection of the COVID itself. Um, plus, when you get the natural infection, the infection can trigger so many things uh, beyond what I just mentioned, right? And we know that neurologically, people, even after they recover, post-COVID um, can have a lot of brain fog, a lot of um, you know, cognitive issues. And this is something that is being actively studied um, beyond uh, so many other systemic issues like problems with their lungs and problems with their heart rates, uh, what we call this autonomia. And so there are countless and countless examples of what can happen after COVID-19 infection itself. So it's so important to try and do everything you can to prevent that. So the bottom line of this is, you know, should you get vaccinated if you are on immunosuppressive medication? Yes, you should. After discussing with your physician the appropriate timing, your appropriate scenario, um, your appropriate safety questions, um, uh, your disease status, how well it is controlled, and will the immune response be reduced? Um, yes, and it's very difficult to currently estimate. Is it reduced by 30%, 40%, 50%? It is reduced, and what it means is that you should continue being extra vigilant and extra careful, and you should continue discussing this with your physician who will be up to date on the evolving data on efficacy of the vaccine in the immunosuppressed patients. That data are very challenging uh, to get, right? Because immunosuppressive 
communications are different with different mechanisms of action. And we are currently accumulating some data on B cell depleting therapies such as rituximab um, that again, while it shows decreased um, numbers of antibodies uh, and some people not making much antibody at all, we do see the vast majority of these people have T cell responses, uh, which are very important in battling, combating and fighting against the virus. Um, other questions that come up is, so what kind of side effects can I expect after I get vaccinated? Say I receive a vaccine and so how will it affect me differently than an average person who doesn't have neuromyelitis optical spectrum disorder. So um, in general population, when you get a COVID vaccine, um, what's expected is that people can have a fever, particularly day two or three, and that's normal. That's your immune system responding to the antigen and sort of calling upon the armies and initiating the steps and protecting itself. Uh, so this is benign, and if you need to use some Tylenol, you can do that. Um, you can always let your physician know if the temperature or fever is difficult to break. Um, you should hydrate plenty. Um, you can feel very tired. You can have a headache, and that's normal. Some people post second vaccination even can have a rash on the arm. And that's why we recommend that if they got a vaccine in one arm, the second one should go into the other arm if at all possible. And it's okay if it was the same arm, but um, that's one of the ways to try and avoid that rash, which is very, very rare and is benign and typically self-resolving. Um, people can have severe fatigue, headache, fever. They can feel very achy and that's baseline. That's normal, that's expected. That actually means that your immune system is responding to the vaccine um, appropriately. So it's nothing to be worried about or scared of. A lot of times um, what I hear from my patients is this mm, sort of misinformation or maybe uh, lack of understanding about these vaccines. These vaccines do not contain live virus. Um, there is no COVID virus in, in, in these vaccines. So it cannot give you an infection. It cannot give you COVID itself. Um, with messenger RNA vaccines, um, it's just an instruction uh, to make a little protein that looks like a spike protein, the, basically like the little button on the coat of the virus and your immune system then recognizes it and basically makes memory uh, B cells and T cells, uh, then you make antibodies and your T cells become specialized in that virus. Um, so that's how it works. So you should not be worried that a vaccine will give you actual COVID or that it will cause you to have COVID symptoms. Please remember that just like with any other vaccine, you can have post-vaccination um, side effects that are expected and normal. And those are fever, headaches, chills, rigors, um, you know, muscle aches, feeling very, uh, you know, not feeling that great for a couple of days. Again, that is actually normal. Um, that is anticipated. And so take it easy, hydrate, communicate with your physician if you're not feeling well. Um, let's make sure that um, that's what's happening. There's nothing else going on at the same time. And mo most importantly, when you get vaccinated, remember that it takes a couple of weeks to really build the immune response. So we definitely see people who just got vaccinated and then, you know, four or five days later, they actually have COVID symptoms. Why? Well, because they just got infected. They went, they got vaccinated. They haven't really mounted a good immune response yet. They went out, they caught the virus or somebody brought it to them in their house. And now they actually have the COVID, uh, COVID disease. They actually have an infection. Or sometimes somebody could have been infected right before they got the vaccine. Um, and then, of course, because of the incubation virus uh, period that the virus takes to show symptoms, um, the person could have been infected, you know, three or four or five days ago. And now they also got COVID vaccine. And so now um, they started showing symptoms of the actual infection that's been brewing even prior to the vaccination. So those cases do occur. I mean, we hear about them. Um, and so even after you got vaccinated, continue being careful, um, general population and particularly people who are immunosuppressed. Now, the question about um, how the symptoms can be different in people with neuromyelitis optical spectrum disorder and people with other autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis and others. 
So we know that when people with a history of transverse myelitis or a history of optic neuritis, when they get an infection or anything that stimulates the immune system, that raises their temperature, we know that they are capable of experiencing a little bit of pseudo exacerbation, right? Meaning old symptoms get a little bit transiently worse. Like for example, a patient who had transverse myelitis and they suffer from muscle spasms, um, neuropathic pain. A lot of times, as many of you know, if you have a UTI, urinary tract infection, or maybe you just had, got, had a flu shot, you, you, you know, and your body's responding to the vaccine, there's a little bit of inflammation, the, the temperature goes up. It is really common to experience a pseudo exacerbation where your spasms get worse, you feel more achy. And yes, that can happen post these vaccines as well. But it is very important that you let your physician know about it if there is worsening the symptoms. In neuromyelitis optical spectrum disorder, it can be challenging sometimes to understand what is a pseudo exacerbation, meaning it's not a real exacerbation, right? There's no new real lesion or inflammatory disease um, happening in the brain or spinal cord or optic nerve versus what is the real exacerbation, right? So we always keep an open mind, meaning that what's really common is that a patient who has a fever or maybe has an infection or recently had a vaccine, they can have a pseudo exacerbation, meaning that there is no actual new lesion, there's no actual new inflammation in the optic nerve or brain or spinal cord, but there is a little bit of, you know, worsening of those old symptoms from that scar tissue, that's transient, that typically will improve over a couple of, uh, over a couple of days. But neuromyelitis optical spectrum disorder is tricky because it would be very difficult to just hear and say, oh, this is a pseudo exacerbation versus a real exacerbation, right? And so in instances where you have new neurological symptoms or worsening of old uh, neurological symptoms, post any infection, post any vaccination, you should always let your physician know and be evaluated to see what's going on. Um, just like what I said uh, when I was reflecting on the study done by uh, Michael Levy uh, and uh, uh, Maureen Lee, uh, Emily, uh, is that patients who were on immunosuppressive medications in their cohort who got vaccinated um, did not appear to have a higher risk, statistically significant higher risk of having an actual NMO attack. And that's for people who are on a good immunosuppressive immunomodulatory treatment for neuromyelitis optica who have stable disease. And so before I start going through some of your questions that came through in the chat, I would like to thank you uh, for coming today for joining us. Um, I hope some of these um, questions and answers have been helpful to you. I will continue to encourage my patients to get vaccinated. Like I said, I'm happy to say that most of my patients are currently vaccinated very successfully. Um, and to kind of reiterate that we have not seen, at least in my practice, we have not seen any exacerbations of NMO or multiple sclerosis in the setting of the vaccine. So if you have been recently diagnosed and you are not yet on an immunosuppressive medication and your disease is not under good control, this is not the time to get vaccinated. You need to be on a good immunosuppressive medication and you need to uh, be stable and you need, to, you need to discuss it with your physician. What is the appropriate timing of the vaccine for you and in your specific um, scenario? Um, I would like to start with the questions at this point. And so let's take a look. Um, all right, so it says, I am currently on Rituxan every three months. I tested negative for the antibodies. Uh, let me see, let me just try to scroll through this really quickly, give me one second. Uh, Uh, give me one second, I'm just trying to, all right, so that will make it a little bit easier. Um, I'm currently on Rituxan every three months. I tested negative for the antibodies, but I did take the T-detect test and that test was positive, which is promising, I think. Are there any other T-cell tests out now that can give us um, 
that can give us more information to tell us if we are more protected. Are booster shots going to be recommended for us Rituxin users? This is a wonderful um, question. So this like clearly illustrates that some people on Rituximab do not have detectable antibody responses. But remember what I told you, those antibody tests are not validated actually, and the CDC cautioned us about using them. So if they're positive for antibodies, that's great. If they're negative, we have to take it with a grain of salt. Now, it's wonderful that you took uh, a T cell test. I suspect that you probably took a T detect that was FDA authorized for emergency under the kind of like emergency use authorization and that you were positive for T cells specific for the virus. That's really a good news. Um, currently, there are no other clinical tests that are, we are widely utilizing to detect T cell immunity, but you can talk to your doctor about T detect test. Um, are booster shots going to be recommended for us Rituxin users? I think it is very plausible, but that recommendation is not out yet, right? I think that's where we are moving in our research towards that, right? And currently, I, I, I think that we are seeing this from the research studies that booster shots can boost the antibody production and likely the T cells as well. Um, and so we are hoping that over the next six months that data will evolve into official recommendations. But as of the moment, um, as you're aware, there is no official recommendation that people on Rituximab need to get booster shots. As the viral, as this pandemic evolves, um, I think the CDC will be issuing new guidelines frequently and we need to continue following that and continue discussing with your uh, physicians the most up-to-date recommendations. So the next question is, in a case where a relapse-prone patient is on rituximab and their infusion was nine months ago, would you recommend that they go ahead with their next scheduled infusion or wait another two months until they become eligible, um, until they become eligible for the... Give me one second, it's just cutting off a little bit. Two months until they become eligible for the vaccine or rather the vaccine becomes available to them in their country. So I don't know whether you are somebody who is aquaporin antibody positive, but if you are aquaporin antibody positive and you have lapsed on your rituximab, um, it would be important to know whether, whether your B cells have started re-emerging because if they have started re-emerging, you're at an increased risk of relapse and you should discuss with your physician the timing of your reinfusion. I think in people with anti-aquaporin-4 antibody positive status, um, controlling the disease takes precedence uh, because the relapses can be so severe in some instances. Um, and so um, in this instance, it would be very difficult for me to answer your question um, based on the fact that I don't know your antibody uh, positivity status. I don't know whether your B cells have returned, but what I will tell you is that if you are an anti-aquaporin antibody positive and you have lapsed on rituximab, uh, if your B cells are coming out, you really should be reinfused because you are risking an attack. And after getting reinfused and making sure your disease under good control, uh, remember that rituximab is typically dosed at every six months. And in some patients, it may be even every four months if their B cells reemerge early. Um, so after you get reinfused, making sure your disease is under good control control, then you should wait until three, at least three or four months until you get vaccinated. Every country is different in their risks of the viruses, but I think, again, the most important thing is controlling your NMO effectively, so you should speak to the doctor and sort of discuss the timing of your reinfusion and the timing of the vaccine. So um, this is a little bit of a specific situation that would need a little bit more of um, uh, information to make that decision. But that question also asked me, basically, is the risk of NMO relapse versus the risk of having to wait for the right time after the infusion to get vaccinated? Yes, I think that I would be very worried about the risk of NMO relapse in somebody who is lapsing on their rituximab dosing, and that would be my biggest fear, actually, okay? How long should, uh, but then again, discuss with your physician, because I, I do not know the patient specifics, the specific scenario in great details. How long should an NMO 
outpatient on Rituxan quarantine from friends, family who don't live in the same household who are vaccinated, but out in public in an area of high transmission, low vaccine rate. Um, so how long should an NMO patient on Rituxan quarantine from friends, family who are vaccinated, but out in public? Um, so I assume that this animal patient on Rituxan is not yet vaccinated and has no immune responses whatsoever from, uh, you know, to COVID infection. That's how I understand this question. Um, so, so this patient, from what I understand, is on Rituximab, is not vaccinated, and now is coming in contact with people who are vaccinated, but they are in an area where there is high transmission, low vaccine rate otherwise, so there's probably a lot of Delta. And what I am basically hearing is that you are wondering about what do I do? You know, my family members, they don't live in the same household, but they are visiting, they are vaccinated, but yes, we hear that even vaccinated people can catch Delta uh, and can transmit Delta. So that's true. So that basically means that those people could potentially, if they're coming in and particularly if they're symptomatic, they could definitely um, potentially bring Delta to you. And if you are not vaccinated and you have zero uh, immune response uh, right now against, uh, against the infection, that would put you in danger. So how long should you quarantine? I think that ideally I would uh, ask these people to wear masks around you, um, not come into your household if they are uh, symptomatic or if they are know that they have uh, come in contact with someone who actually had COVID or COVID symptoms. Um, and I would basically in this instance, I would probably be extra cautious. And so if they are in your household, they have to wash their hands, um, they have to wear um, their masks around you. Um, and of course, if they're symptomatic, they should not be visiting you. Um, so so, so it's, it's really tough to answer how long you should quarantine because quarantine in this instance is sort of uh, very, uh, it's, it's a challenging thing to do because it's, you know, things are everywhere. Do you recommend a third dose of the vaccine for the patients using immunosuppressants? I already received the two doses and I use mycophenolate mofetil. Um, so very valid question. Um, and it's not necessarily what I recommend. It's literally what um, the CDC guidelines are right now. I think we are moving towards the next steps of possibly getting the booster shots. Those are recommendations are not officially out yet because that is something that is being actively studied. Yes, in research studies, we have seen that people who are on mycophenolate mofetil who haven't um, gotten a really good immune response after two doses in research studies, they have shown that a third dose could boost those immune responses. That is true. But at the same time, we have to understand that we don't yet know the safety profile of doing this. And so as such, while we have small research studies showing safety, uh, we cannot right now kind of issue a wide recommendation to do that. So we have to wait for more data, for more CDC guidelines for immunosuppressed patients. And I think that uh, data and those guidelines will be coming um, soon. Uh, all vaccines on the uh, market safe for the immunosuppressed and more patients or only specific ones such as Moderna or Pfizer. So I am thinking about Moderna, Pfizer, and the ones that are available in the United States like Johnson & Johnson. So all of these vaccines are safe for people who are immunosuppressed. Moderna and Pfizer does not contain live COVID virus and um, Johnson & Johnson does not contain a live COVID virus either. Uh, my 19-year-old mock positive daughter, who is in rituximab, has had three COVID vaccinations, two Moderna, one Pfizer, and after each of the last two has negative spike antibody test results. She recently had a negative adaptive biotech T-cell test. What do you suggest we do next? Um, so this is a tough one. Uh, I think that, remember how I mentioned that the um, negative spike antibody test uh, result, it's not validated in evaluating the efficacy of the vaccines. Um, 
specifically. It's only validated in the context of natural infection. So you have to also take that result with a grain of salt. Um, and then she recently had a negative adaptive biotech T cell test. What do you suggest that we do next? Um, so that would basically mean that she did not make a lot of T cell immunity either. So that's actually rare, um, at least in our patients with um, MS who are very often on B cell depleting therapies. We know that up to 80% of people actually have very nice T cell responses. I, um, you know, I would say the T detect test can be pursued, could be even repeated. Um, but if she's not responding and she is MOG antibody positive, I would discuss with your physician whether it is advisable or possible to allow any immune reconstitution to get her vaccinated. The problem with mock positive antibody um, animal spectrum disorder is that we do not have a good data to state that, well, once your B cells come up by 2% or 3%, therefore the risk of relapse immediately increases. We, don't not, we do not have that level of data, but we do have that data for the anti-buffering for antibody positive people. So for MOGAD, um, it's a little bit more of a gray area. I think that if a patient is 19 and has very, and is very healthy otherwise, and is not considered to be high risk for um, severe COVID, I would almost worry more about the risk of MOG relapse, but I think it's a unique scenario. I do not know the details of um, you know, how, how active this MOG disease has been and what neurological deficits um, your daughter has. So what I would do, I would discuss with the physician um, to see if, an immune reconstitution of some level uh, could be attempted. And this doesn't mean that I necessarily am telling you that this is a recommendation. This is a discussion because there is no data behind it. So I suggest that, you know, if you are really set to get some antibody response or T cell responses, I mean, the only way to do this would be to allow for some immune reconstitution by delaying the rituximab infusion a little bit. But then again, that's a very gray area because doing that could potentially increase the risk of relapse. And so it's a very, very tough discussion. Um, otherwise, you could also discuss what other medications could be used that perhaps are associated with uh, less immunosuppression. Um, it's, it's, it's a unique scenario, but I would say that a 19 year old that is otherwise healthy and is considered to be low risk for severe COVID, um, I would be very hesitant to mess with immunotherapy on which she is stable, presumably, right? Um, at the fear that I might cause a mock attack if I am lapsing in the appropriate dosing. So I hope this was helpful, but it's, it's a really, really tough scenario. Uh, let's see. So we have time for a few more questions. Um, so here we have a question about, um, is there any data out yet on severe breakthrough cases for those who are on B cell depleters but have been vaccinated? So the best data on B cell depleting treatments that I can really relate to is our people with history of transverse myelitis, optic neuritis, people with multiple sclerosis or people with NMO. And that data on B cell depletion, typically we are not seeing that the disease is more severe on B cell depletion unless that patient has a severe neurological disability, like using a walker in a wheelchair, has trouble moving arms, has trouble breathing well, um, or has other comorbidities such as obesity, um, issues with um, asthma, diabetes, heart disease, liver disease. So overall, even though the risk and rituximab is slightly higher, 
generally, patients who are low risk for severe COVID fare quite well uh, when they have the infection on rituximab. But yes, um, rituximab and B-cell depleted therapies have been associated with a slightly higher risk of hospitalization. Um, so that data are evolving. Having said that, if I were to reflect on a population that very commonly um, is on B-cell depleting therapies, a population that is much more prevalent in the United States, that's MS uh, patients. MS patients also get transverse myelitis and they get optic neuritis, and many of them are on B-cell depleting therapies like rituximab, ocrelizumab, et cetera. And among them, even though there are reports of a slightly higher association with, uh, with the risk of hospitalization, most of them have um, very mild or moderate um, disease, meaning they have very good outcomes uh, among patients who have gotten COVID itself on rituximab and ocrevus. Um, most people have had mild to moderate disease that's in the MS population specifically because there are so many of the MS patients on these drugs and NMO in the United States. But the one, the times when we did see um, a little bit more of an issue um, and high risk of hospitalization, uh, more severe disease. It's actually in people who have uh, more comorbidities, more issues uh, with asthma, diabetes, obesity, et cetera, et cetera. So those people are significantly higher risk, including breakthrough infections. But to summarize um, is that we have not seen breakthrough infections in our vaccinated people, but only occasionally. Um, a few of my patients to whom this has happened have done well, uh, but that data is not out yet. So that data will be evolving over the next few months, hopefully, in terms of how do pe people fare with breakthrough infections if they get Delta status post vaccination, but perhaps not an adequate immune response. So that's um, actually a homework for all of us physicians to do uh, and get back to you. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for these questions. Um, I appreciate everybody joining uh, me. I think that ultimately, um, you know, the message that I would like to send is that get vaccinated, but also do discuss the timing with your physician. And thank you. And just before we go, I'm so sorry about that. And just before we go, I do want to share a very special photo that Dr. Elena um, shared with me that I think will be very nice for our audience to see. So let me just pull that up real quickly. And Elena, you can definitely give some context. Oh, host to say. Yeah, sure. So this is this is my 80 year old uh, grandmother that you're about to see. And she has been just incredibly terrified of vaccines and she has not gotten any vaccines for years and years, but she has successfully uh, completed uh, Moderna, uh, I'm sorry, Pfizer vaccine and has done extremely well. So I am just very, very proud. Um, she's 80 and this is her, you can see she's not looking that excited, but she did it, she was a champion. And um, so she's currently feeling a little bit safer, uh, but this is a little bit of an epic picture where you clearly see somebody is not really happy about it, but she did it and she did very well. And that's been over five months since then. Amazing. Thank you, <laughs> thank you for sharing, Samara. So Samara, thank you so much for inviting me again. And thanks to everyone. I think, like I said, please reach out to your physicians to discuss your unique situations. But please know that for those people who are on immunosuppressive medications, generally um, the vaccines are considered to be safe, um, the current vaccines for COVID. Um, and then it's just a matter of discussion and the timing of the vaccine and the efficacy. And that data will continue evolving. So we hope to have more uh, specific data for you in the upcoming six months. Lovely. And for everyone who's here today, thank you again for joining us. This session is going to be, it's been recorded, so it will be available on TSF's Facebook and YouTube pages. So please feel free to go back, share it and reference it as you want. Um, the other thing I would also ask is that if you have any topics that you'd like to hear about um, or any specific specialist, please feel free to email us. So the um, email address is info at smirefoundation.org. Until next time, uh, thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Elena. Thank you. Bye.